The question which I think is one of the most, um, which was one of the most important for me and I think continues to be, I think particularly in the cultural moment that we live in today, is the question of meaning. And I mean, look, personally, the reason why I think that wrestling with that question was so important in terms of um, opening up to me the idea that actually meaning in life is not something that A, I, I create and B, is not particularly I create my own relative meaning, but this is this is fairly insubstantial at the end of the day. That was by far the most, I think, important question for me. But I think it continues to be one of the most important questions in our culture. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. Sarah, you've sort of come from, I guess, a sort of fairly staunch atheism, you're beginning to kind of move into agnosticism, I suppose, at this point in your journey. And there was there's a point you mention in Coming to Faith Through Dawkins, where you have an encounter with Professor Andrew Briggs, who he sort of questions your agnosticism. Would you just say a little bit about that? Because he was a Christian and a scientist. Yeah, so yeah. again, you must have been like, oh, another Christian scientist. <laughs> yes, that's right. So I was actually... Um, I was invited to a dinner because, funnily enough, the topic of my PhD thesis was on the historical relationship between what we now call science and Christianity. I was invited to a dinner, which was a dinner for, um, I think it was the International Society for Science and Religion. Um, this is while I was at Oxford. It was actually at my college at Wolfson. And so I went along. I was probably one of the only, one of the very, well, very few historians there because for the most part it's um, scientists. And... So I was sitting next to Professor Briggs, and it was it's a funny thing. It wasn't a particularly um, long conversation or anything, and it was just really one line that stuck with me. But, of course, when um, Professor Briggs, we know each other, and so um, yeah, he was probably surprised to find a historian there and, and was quite um, sort of open asking me about what I believe. So I told him about my PhD thesis, and I um, told him about the fact that I had once considered myself an atheist or a secular humanist I sort of talked about that and said but I but now I'm not I'm not really quite sure and I just I just don't know because I can't I can't subscribe to this anymore and what what Andrew Briggs said was that um well can you really sit on the fence forever it was yeah he really made me question whether or not it was actually um enough or an adequate kind of response to really the biggest question in life to actually be an agnostic, to kind of sit on the fence. And it was just, he asked, he's, it was sort of in a very gentle way, but but also a questioning way, uh, also the, a way in which made me realise that that was not an adequate response to, the, <laughs> to really the most important question in life. And it really stuck with me. Well, and I guess the next step on your journey was you went to um, a university in Florida and when you were there, you ended up going to church. I mean, that's quite a big step, isn't it, from agnosticism. Would you just fill in the blanks a little bit? How did you get to the place where you were thinking, I probably want to go and try church and see what's going on there? Yes. So this was my first job, as it were. So I'd had the um, research fellowship at Oxford. And then so my first kind of tenure track job was at Florida State University, Um and this was kind of also a moment in life when I suppose moving to a new country um, and just finding myself in a moment in which I could, um, I think I found that I was able to explore, Christ that it gave me the kind of freedom, I suppose, to explore Christianity in a way that I hadn't, hadn't really felt able to earlier. Um, and so one day I decided to walk into church um, I think partly because there was a desire to really see whether or not whether or not everything which had seemed so compelling intellectually and which made sense in terms of human reason could actually um, make sense on a kind of the faith, <laughs> whether or not the faith and reason could actually um, come together. And so I walked into church for the first time by myself um, on a Sunday morning, and they were celebrating the Lord's Supper. I was quite a liturgical church, um, and they were playing a hymn by Ralph Vaughan Williams. And I think the experience of 
being and sort of witnessing the liturgy of the Lord's Supper was really quite remarkable for me because in as somebody who grew up in a very kind of secular culture um, and for whom subscribe, like my view of the universe was when I was an atheist was basically a materialistic one. That is to say that, you know, nothing exists on a metaphysical level, like there is nothing outside of matter in motion. And so this is one of the, for somebody who had thought of themselves as a materialist, then, then the question of whether or not there could be anything transcendent, anything sacred is a massive question, right? Because this is not something which is, which is even part of your previous worldview. But what happens when I walk into the church is that actually witnessing the liturgy of, of the Lord's Supper, and I say witnessing because, of course, I'd never been baptized or christened, as it were, as a child, um, and so I just sat in the pews. But the liturgy of the Lord's Supper seemed to invite me into a kind of into a kind of sacred rite, as it were, um, which I didn't quite understand. I mean, I heard the words of, you know, this is my body, like take, eat, this is my body which is given for you and drink, this is my blood which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. That idea that God would become flesh and die for me was um, was sort of profound, but also sort of strange and confronting. It's not just beautiful, but at this point, to me, it's strange and confronting. But actually, I think that what happens in liturgy is that I witness a, a tradition which is actually revealing that God's people are not just a kind of horizontal sort of family across the world geographically, but that in partaking of the Lord's Supper, they are remembering and reenacting something which is also across time as well, which is vertical. And of course, as a historian, this makes me realize that there is a kind of, there's a historic, there's a profound kind of historical community here called the church, which I'd never really thought deeply about before either. So the idea that people might be partaking of this communal meal at the same time across the world, but also doing something which Christ had done with his disciples and which had been done for millennia since Christ celebrated the Last Supper was a kind of a glimpse into a kind of sacredness and transcendence that I had never taken seriously before. Um, and I found myself quite moved, um, really to the, like, I think I, I got sort of emotional um, and a little bit teary, which I kind of, you know, someone with British yeah. tradition managed to stifle. <laughs> um, but the fact that this might, might actually appeal to my emotions, that there might actually be some kind of experience here was really profound, yeah. So I suppose you've had the kind of intellectual challenge at Oxford and Cambridge where you're thinking through the kind of logical outworkings of atheism and thinking that it perhaps doesn't satisfy some of the big questions you've had. And then you have this, um, for want of a better word, this emotional experience where actually um, Christianity perhaps meets some of your more emotional needs. What then happened next? Well, this at that point, I suppose I'm just on a, on a path of um, sort of fumbling around, reading a lot and, and sort of going to church by myself. Um, but uh, one of my friends who's also a new faculty member at Florida State gave me a copy of C.S. Lewis's book, Christianity, which I've read. And I remember that even when I was wanting to, well, I was supposed to be sort of preparing my lectures. Actually, the book, I remember that the book I actually really wanted to read all the time was Mere Christianity. And, I, you know, I'm thinking about why this had such an effect on me. But I think in many ways it was because Lewis had a kind of um, just a kind of learned and um, sensible humility about him and that he was able to talk about, he was able to kind of talk about questions which I had been wrestling with, um, particularly kind of the question of human value and human dignity and that larger question, therefore, of, you know, is there a kind of, is there a, natural law and natural justice, which is a topic of one of those really early chapters. And he's able to do that in a way which is um, particularly sort of um, humble and unassuming and yet is able to kind of present the complexities of those 
ideas. So he's basically in those early chapters talking about our yearning for justice and you know whether or not there is a natural law. And I think as given what had just happened to me a year or two earlier, which is going to those singer the singer lectures and and coming to an understanding through my own reading of what atheist ethics looked like, particularly on that question of whether or not there is justice and objective moral values and so forth. And then um, reading what what C.S. Lewis does in Near Christianity, Lewis was able to present Christianity um, in a way which which made far more sense than atheism. So do you think there was a, a sort of particular moment where you made a decision to sort of get rid of the agnosticism and pursue Christianity wholehearted? Or was it a kind of culmination of lots of different steps along the journey? No, I think it was, there were many, many kind of different and fumbly steps <laughs> and many moments, to be honest, in which I which I wrestled with it, in which I wondered, you know, question my own motives. Why, you know, why am I doing this? Do I, do I really believe this? Do I want something else? Do I want something which isn't God? How could I, is it possible to want God and desire God for who God is rather than want something that God can give me? Am I genuine? And so, you know, there's all kinds of questions and um, a really kind of a long kind of journey there. But I do remember that I did one night um, pray the, the the sort of sin's prayer. Yeah. Now, in, in the book, Coming to Faith Free Dawkins, there are three big areas that you highlight, particularly the question of history, the question of human value and the question of meaning. I mean, were those three areas equally important or was there one that sort of impacted you more than the others, would you say? Ah, oh, interesting. Now, do you mean at the time or do you mean now, I wonder? I mean, I guess probably at the time because that was what sort of yeah led you to your but 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 also now I mean do you feel in which ways do yeah. you feel that actually Christianity has answered those like in a, in a particular way that perhaps atheism couldn't yeah yeah oh I think the question which I think is one of the most um which was one of the most important for me and I think continues to be I think particularly in the cultural moment that we live in today um, is the question of meaning. And I mean, look, personally, the reason why I think that that question was so, wrestling with that question was so important in terms of um, opening up to me the idea that actually meaning in life is not something that A, I, I create and B, is not particularly, I, think I might create my own relative meaning, but this is, this is fairly insubstantial at the end of the day. Um, that was... That was by far the most, I think, important question for me. Um, but I think it continues to be one of the most important questions in our culture, in no small part because we live in a cultural moment in which there's no there's no real sense in which our culture tells us that we need to wrestle with deeper questions about meaning or indeed with the idea of meaning either in a historical sense or um, in any larger context than the self. And so for most people, and I kind of say this as somebody who is, of course, you know, university professor, so in the context of actually speaking to a lot of my um, students, who are, of course, now different generation, really, they are immersed in this culture in which meaning is primarily a sort of creation of the self. This is a culture that says you know, you do you, live your best life and so forth. And so that is to them the extent of me of meaning. Um and it's incredibly it's an incredibly impoverished view of meaning. Um it's also a view of of the kind of yeah, there's no it's also a kind of there's profound kind of historical amnesia there too. This is not how we've thought um sure. in the whole kind of history of of ideas, actually, this is not how we've been thinking about these questions. But in many ways, this is the kind of issue that defines the contemporary West because we don't we don't tend to think it in any context larger than the self. Well, we're going to be talking in a future episode about the kind of ahistoric age that we're living in, where we've sort of forgotten about our history um, through your wonderful book, Priest of History. But 
How would you then answer that huge question of meaning? I mean, presumably you think Christianity has quite a lot to say to these big questions. I mean, I think probably the best way to approach this is that um, is to think that really the Bible gives us a story um, about who God is and that he chooses to reveal himself to us. And so questions that we have about meaning, about whether it's meaning meaning of life or ultimate meaning, all these questions, um, really it's an issue of, well, what is the context in which, what is the kind of story that makes the most sense, as it were? Um, and actually when you, when you encounter Christianity, when you read the Bible and you engage with the the Bible's understanding of what those questions are and what the kind of responses to them are, I think that's a far more there's a far more robust account of all of the big questions of which meaning is one, um, really than any other kind of philosophy, um, atheism included. This is a massive question, just as we finish this podcast, but how do you feel yeah. that Jesus has changed your life? Um. I think the best way of summing summing this up is that there's been a kind of a turning, a change of direction. Um, like I was saying earlier, I'd always thought of my life as a kind of the, the classic kind of millennial generation idea that I create my own meaning and I create my own life. And in that story, I am at the center. The individual, the unhinged individual, is in the center. But Christianity has completely reoriented my life in that I am no longer the center of my life, which is a profound relief. Um, <laughs> but it has reoriented my life. There are far more sort of profound and serious consequences of all that because now my life is not primarily about myself. It is about God. Um, and that is a that has enormous kind of ramifications for how I live and what I value and how I spend my time. And what I love and how I try to, yeah, you know, all all the ways that we might try to try to actually live life. But I think, yeah, the best way of describing this is that there is a kind of a turning, a reorientation. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. For more shows, resources, and our newsletter, visit premierunbelievable.com. <laughs>